This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So having a structure right here, you know, let's see, 12, uh, 15 feet we said, let's see, three, six, nine, Yeah, I mean, this area is raised up, and that side is sloped. Um, you know, if we wanted to go more than 15 feet this direction, say, you know, 18 feet, you've got plenty of space, I think. Hi everyone, Nico from Nebula Photos. I'm here with Timothy Emerson, who is an architect, and he is going to give me some tips about building my backyard observatory that I have recently gotten some plans for, and I haven't started construction, so, uh, it was really great that Timothy reached out to me and offered this consultation because, uh, he has a lot of great ideas, and I think this is going to be really helpful to anyone out there who is considering building their own custom observatory in their backyard. So, uh, Timothy, first, just tell me a little bit about your background as an architect and uh, sort of why you reached out to me. Uh, yeah, so I got into uh, astrophotography about a year and a half ago, and, you know, pretty much made all the beginner mistakes, bought a telescope that was too big. Couldn't get the mount working, tracking errors. Of course, it was the middle of January, so I was really frustrated and, and cold. Yep. So I started watching a lot of videos. I came across your videos and some other people. Uh, and they were a lifesaver to me, like learning this hobby. Uh, and so, you know, the work that you guys are doing on you, putting out free YouTube videos, uh, uh, I, I kind of wanted to give back a little bit. Uh, and so I reached out to you. I am an architect. Um, I practice in Massachusetts, uh, a little bit in New Hampshire. You know, then you started doing videos on, you know, backyard observatories. I was like, I can, I can definitely help you with that. You know, it's something I could, I could do. You know, if nothing else, kind of give you my two cents and maybe, you know, show you where you might have some problems. What would you say are are the biggest problems that here in New Hampshire we have to be aware of when building something like this? Yeah. So this is a good, a good point because you've got people all over the country, all over the globe, and everybody has, you know, a, a different in environment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be the biggest factor uh, in planning your observatory build. Here in New England, we've got everything you could possibly imagine. We've got warm weather, we've got humid weather, we've got cold weather, frost, uh, and having all of those things together makes it pretty challenging, you know, uh, I would say the biggest thing for us would be uh, the winter time and frost, uh, and the the secondary thing to that would be having a you know very humid environment in the summertime, uh, as and in the fall, uh, so moisture problems. Do you advise getting like air conditioning for an observatory, or do, or is it is it because the roof rolls off? I guess it's actually I should back up in the style that I want to build. The roof is going to roll off yeah. that allows it to really cool off to ambient temperature quite quickly and sort of, yeah. but for, I guess a lot of the time it's going to be, the air will be trapped in there. And I guess also the humidity would be. So how do you, how do you go about sort of like dealing with moisture and things like that? Yeah. So, you know, having a roof that comes off makes it very tricky, tricky, especially, um, a roll off roof. Uh, and that, your primary issues are going to be where the roof is connected to the walls, where the roller bearings are going to be. There's really no way to air seal something like mm -hmm. that. Some people uh, in like a prefabricated kind of insulated uh, enclosure with maybe, you know, a, a pop-up roof or something like that, where it's got a nice gasket that seals around, something like that would be worth, uh, you know, dehumidifying in the summertime. Uh, but something like this, you know, air wants to be in equilibrium, right? So if we create this nice sealed box uh, and try to dehumidify, or let's say we create this box and it's not quite sealed and we start de dehumidifying it, well, we're going to take the, hum uh, the humid air that's in there, but that will force the air that's outside to drive inside the building. Oh. So you're really kind of not doing anything by trying to dehumidify uh, a structure like this. So what I would recommend is actually make sure that there's a way of natural ventilation, right? So, you know, this is not a structure that you want to be heated anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in the summertime, we want to keep the humid air out. So, you know, a fan towards the gable end. And at the bottom, we can 
we can have some louvers to kind of pull in fresh air mm. um, and get the air moving. If we can get the air moving, we're less likely to have condensation. So one thing I've seen is, uh, on the, you know, you, you have an intake fan and an outtake fan or something mm -hmm. like that, and that maybe will move the air across the top. But I've never heard about this louvers towards the bottom. Can you explain that a little? Yeah, so uh, in a structure like this, up towards the top, the air is going to be the warmest, mm -hmm. right? Because warm air is going to rise. So the idea of having the louvers at the bottom is you're bringing cool air in. Mm -hmm. Now, this glass is a perfect example here uh, in our humid climate. Uh, we have get condensation here. So the, the air around us has moisture in it, right? This, this water here didn't come from the inside of the right. glass, right? So we've got this warm air, which can hold a lot of moisture. And cold air has less moisture in it. So as soon as the air comes in contact with the glass, it cools the air off and the moisture falls out of the air. Hmm. Right? So if we can put the louver, if we put the fan at the top, we're pulling the warm, humid air out and we're bringing in cooler, less moist air at the bottom. And what, what is a louver? Um, a louver would be like a screen. Okay. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it usually has metal fins on it. Uh, so when you've got driving rain, it kind of protects the opening. It's not okay. like a regular yeah. open window. And so you would build that right into the wall? Or? Yep, you could okay. build it into the wall. You can get pre manufactured metal louvers. Uh -huh. um, you've probably seen a lot on gable vents, so like houses, yep. right? So the attic vent that's kind of sticking off the side sure. there, that would be a louver. Oh, another thing, sort of related to this maybe, is you mentioned it might be a good idea as an observatory to have. Of windows. Could you explain why? Yeah, so off camera, we were talking about our climate specifically. Uh, and because we have so much moisture in the spring and the fall, uh, we often get um, mold and mildew, um, along with some rot, which we'll probably talk about later. Uh, but one thing is with that moisture, and you know, this particular structure that we're looking at, it's wood. Now, Mold, uh, you know, it's one thing that we're concerned about in New England quite a bit. And mold needs a few ingredients to grow. Uh, it needs a source of food, it needs uh, water, and it needs darkness. So, you know, it's nice when you close up the hatches and keep everything nice and uh, sealed up in the daytime and in the nighttime you roll it off. But in the daytime when you're not using your observatory, the most humid time, uh, in the warmest time, you're giving mold an opportunity to grow. So my recommendation would be to have a few windows uh, in there to kind of keep the level of light up and kind of reduce the one of the at least one of the variables for a chance for mold to grow. Mold spores will you know they'll feed on the wood, but that doesn't also mean that they can't get on all your equipment as well. So that reminds me that I've heard different things about sort of heat dissipation. When you roll off the roof, you want the heat from the building to get out of there as quickly as possible. And so I've heard that wood is generally better for letting the heat off than concrete. But then I've also heard like the reason that a lot of people leave the inside of their buildings unfinished like that is because that will also help with getting the heat out quickly. Do you agree with all that or is there anything you could elaborate on? I would agree with that. Okay. Um, concrete is what we call a thermal mass. Once it warms up, uh, it takes a while to dissipate, right? Um, you know, in older homes like this one, you probably have a big fireplace somewhere, um, and fireplace made of stone, wintertime it warms up, and, uh, you know, it'll help disperse the heat and keep things warmer longer. The same is true for a concrete slab on grade. And in even some passive kind of uh, low energy homes, we use concrete and dark flooring material like uh, tile to kind of let the concrete absorb more light so that at night when the sun's gone and the temperature outside is cooled off, it releases that energy back into the building. Hmm. So something like this, you know, insulation is not really going to help you a lot because you're going to be rolling off the, you know, the purpose is not to live in this space, yeah. right? The purpose is for astrophotography. So I would agree keeping the structure as light as possible, you know, even insulation 
will, I mean, the, the purpose of insulation is to slow down the transfer of air. Yeah. And so when you roll off that roof, its job is to hold on to that warm air as long as possible. So yes, insulation would uh, slow down the heat, uh, the cooling of your, your observatory. Another question I had about these buildings is um, a lot of people with a roll-off roof roll the roof off to the north. And I, my, main, my understanding is the main reason is just because it's important, more important to have a clear view to the east, west, and south uh, right. for astronomy purposes. Um, I am going to be pretty blocked by trees to the west, so I was thinking of instead rolling the roof off to the west because in terms of an obstruction, it's mm -hmm. not going to matter. But is there any engineering or structural reason to roll the roof off in a certain direction? No, okay. not really. Uh, if you live in like a, a very open kind of flat region where you're susceptible to, you know, not like microbursts as in like tornado quality, but like really heavy winds, uh, it is, it would probably be beneficial for you to uh, orientate your building kind of like a weather vane uh -huh. into the wind, right? So that you don't get kind of a side wind to try and lift up your roof or expose it to any more kind of severe wind than, you know, than normal. So something that I've heard from a number of people, including Alan, who I recently visited, you mentioned, is um, over time it becomes harder for the roof to roll off because of um, the roof, I mean, the building sort of changing over time. Yeah. How do you... And it seems like people have different issues there, but what is sort of like general advice for how to prevent shift uh, and for, for that to be a hard issue with a roll-off roof building? Yeah, I mean, so most likely what's going on there is, I mean, in our climate, we have frost, right? But we, and, and in some Southern climates and Western climates, they have, you know, what's called expansive soil, soil that holds moisture and water. Um, and the soil moves, right? So in either case, whether it's frost or expansive soils, we want to design a footing that is going to best resist what we would expect to see in your local climate, right? Mm -hmm. So in our case, we're talking about piers. So we can't just build right on the ground like some southern climates can. We have to dig deep, and we have to dig below the frost line. So for New Hampshire, that's the code minimum is 48 inches. We've been talking about piers, and just to make it clear, there, there's the piers that the telescope are going to go on to, um, and then there's the piers that the building are going to go on to. Uh, and in both cases, though, I have to dig a hole that's at least four feet deep um, and fill it with concrete. When I've been digging holes for other reasons, like my vegetable garden, I've noticed I have very uh, rocky soil where I'm like taking out boulders like this big a lot. Um, so what are your recommendations for digging holes if I want to do this myself? Yeah, so growing up in New England myself, I've had to dig a lot of holes in this kind of ground. Uh, and what I recommend is you can get a post hole digger can help um, or just a spade shovel. Mm -hmm. Uh, a post hole digger is going to help you dig a more straight hole. If you're using a long handled spade shovel, you know, you'll have a more tapered hole just to be able to get down to the bottom. When you encounter a rock, I mean, if, as long as it's not the size of this table here, um, you know, those boulder, you know, the kind of a cobble size stones, what I recommend is getting, I've always called it a pry bar. Um, but you can get them at most home centers or you know uh, local hardware stores. It's about five feet long. It's a cylindrical rod. At the bottom of it, it has a taper, and at the top, it has a kind of a round, um, flared end at the top. And it weighs about fifty pounds. And when you hit a rock, you know you can pound the ground to kind of loosen it up. You can get beside the rock and kind of pry it into the hole. Uh, the idea here is that the girth of the hole can be large. The girth is not what we want to avoid. The depth of the hole we want to be at four feet minimum to be below the frost line. But it's kind of imperative that when you're digging a hole that you don't go 
the bottom of your concrete footing doesn't go below undisturbed soil. Soil that's been undisturbed has the highest compressive rate it's, it's ever gonna have. Once you disturb it, there's no amount of pounding that you can do to kind of recreate that um, existing undisturbed uh, capacity for the soil to resist load. In our conversation so far, what am I missing? What do you think are things that I haven't thought about in, in building this myself? If we are doing a wood construction like you are, uh, most cases people just dig the sauna tube. They, they dig the holes, put the sauna tube down, and fill it, and then they build their wood structure on top of it. But my recommendation to you, and particularly in our climate where we have a lot of groundwater and moisture, is to underneath of your building remove all the organic material, not just where the the posts are going to go, but remove all the organic material and lay down plastic, uh, a thick six mil or 10 mil uh, plastic continuous underneath the whole thing. I hit a rock already. That's yeah. lovely. All right. So the organic soil is this black stuff, right? Uh, okay. uh, and it's got the roots in it. Typically in New England, it's not going to go very deep, right? When you're stripping the topsoil, you'll just take the first 12 inches right off the top. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's labor intensive, uh, but, you know, you're, you're removing all the ability for the soil to hold moisture in that spot. Mm -hmm. um, and you're replacing it with the plastic to keep the water from driving up. And you're putting stone over the top to, um, uh, to keep the plastic down. Um, and something like that too, you know, critters that do go under there aren't going to be burrowing into that stone right. material. So it makes it less habitable for them. But when I just had the plans, it was like sort of like a little bit loose in my mind and talking to you, it's like becoming a little bit more clear, I think. So this has been really helpful. Um, well, thank you so much, Tim. And, uh, hopefully this is helpful to other people building their observatories, uh, I'm going to be, you know, sharing my progress on the channel. And so uh, hopefully people can give helpful advice in the comments and we can continue having discussions about this. Thank you very much, Nico. Thanks. This video is sponsored by Squarespace and I use Squarespace for my personal portfolio at nicocarver.com because Squarespace makes it super easy with their website builder and their flexible but professional templates. There's a template for every kind of website you'd want to make, but then of course you can customize them however you wish quite easily with their drag and drop engine. And of course, since it's 2023, these designs look great on mobile devices like your smartphone through responsive design. I've also found Squarespace takes the hassle out of managing a website, no more fiddling with CSS for hours just to get something to look right. And there is a huge amount of included features with Squarespace, like if you need an online store, that's built in. So if you're looking for any kind of website, whether it's a portfolio of your photographs or a site for your business, I think you're gonna love Squarespace. You can get a free trial today at squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, use squarespace.com slash nebula photos for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, this has been Nico Carver at Nebula Photos. Clear skies, everyone.